Uh, Dr. Ventura um, um, received her medical degree in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, she did a fellowship in, uh, in Recife, Brazil, um, also in uh, Sao Paulo, and she's now at the Bascom Palmer um, Eye Institute in Miami doing yet another, another advanced fel retinal fellowship. So just a brief history about how I got to know her. So um, earlier this year, once Zika became uh, known and obvious, some of the major challenges that would be coming as a result of Zika, uh, our president, Wayne Holden, who is, I think is in the DC office today and watching uh, from one of the conference rooms there, uh, formed a team to look at how RTI could respond in many different ways. So I ended up going to Brazil to see about the possibility of establishing relationships to do longitudinal follow-up studies of babies with congenital Zika syndrome and their families. Um, while in Recife, I went to the Altina Ventura Foundation and was able to meet um, Camilla's mother, Liana Ventura, who is the director of the foundation there. And um, in just the um, hour and a half or so there, we had a great relationship and a good building and a great uh, conversation. I then met Camilla um, both in, uh, at the CDC had a, a Zika meeting and then NIH had a Zika meeting. And so now she's here working with Ann Wheeler and with me to help develop a proposal to, um, that's in response to an NIH um, RFP on uh, global brain disorders. So Camilla, Dr. Ventura, it's great to have you here. She's going to be talking about, kind of giving a big picture overview of, um, of what we know about congenital Zika syndrome, but specifically about her work on ocular, um, ocular problems. So, welcome. Thank you, Don. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, as Don mentioned, I'll be focusing on the ophthalmological findings in these babies, but of course, I'll mention all about what we have been seeing in these babies. Oops. So before I begin, there is a big team behind of me, it's just not me, and to the left you see all of my team, the ophthalmological team, but of course we have the neurologists, all the uh, therapists involved, and the institutions that are from Recife and from abroad that have been supporting us and have, helping us all along the way. A little bit on the background of Zika, we by now know by heart that Zika virus is a flavivirus, and it is from the same genus as dengue fever, yellow fever, West Nile, uh, Japanese encephalitis viruses. It is a single-stranded RNA virus that was first isolated in rhesus monkeys in Uganda in 1947, and only seven years later, it was isolated for the first time in Nigerians, in humans. Um, and why is that only six years later we're so concerned about Zika virus, it's because with time Zika has been changing its transmission cycle. So in the beginning we know that it was a salvatic cycle only where the mosquitoes would transmit the disease to monkeys. Um, with time it became more urban when the, the mosquitoes started infecting humans and now we're talking about a, a vertical transmission where mothers are passing the disease to their babies through the placenta. And what we're seeing is that the virus has been spreading around the world and bringing great concern. It started um, with two strains, basically the African strain and the Asian strain. And the Asian strain has been causing outbreaks around the world. Um, first, The first one was in the Yap Islands in uh, Micronesia in 2007. Then it caused another outbreak in the French Polynesia in 2014. It was first uh, seen in the Americas when it caused an outbreak in 2014 in the Easter Island and now in 2015 it reached the the continent and Brazil was the first uh, the first country in the continent affected so we know that the modes of transmission we have been, many of the scientists have been focusing in the modes of transmission of Zika virus as well, since we knew before that the main transmitter was, and the only transmitter at the time was the mosquitoes, the Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. But now we know about the congenital transmission, we have been seeing reports on sexual transmission as well, blood transfusion, 
and other possible modes which includes organ transplants, breastfeeding, saliva, and just recently we see this report on the tears of uh, tested mice and they were able to isolate a live virus in the tears of mice. Um, so things are happening so fast and since May 2015 when the the first autochthonous case was reported in, in Brazil, uh, 48 countries and territories uh, in the Americas have been reporting Zika and 58 countries around the world have had Zika so far. So this has become a global emergency and a world concern. And talking a little bit about US, we know that uh, we have local acquired cases now in, in the US, 43 to be more precise. Um, and this was the update done by CDC in September 21. Before that, we had travel associated cases only, so this is recent, and it first got to the continent affecting Florida, the state of Florida. Uh, of course, that we already had local cases um, being reporting in Puerto Rico, which is an American territory, but this is the first time it's being reported in the continent. So what brings us more concern is not the um, amount of patients infected and as a total, but uh, the amount of pregnant women that we already have evidence of uh, Zika infection because now we know of all the effects, not all, but lots of the information we know about uh, the congenital Zika syndrome and how it can um, severely affect these babies. So we already have this data also from CDC. Um, more than 2,000 pregnant women in the U.S. with pregnant, with serological evidence for Zika. And for you to understand a little bit of how we got involved with congenital Zika syndrome and a little bit of our history on Zika, it all began in October 2015 when the, my state, so if you see in this map of Brazil, the red state is Pernambuco state, is located in the northeast of Brazil by the coast. And um, we started, re this was the first state to start reporting microcephaly in Brazil and it was in October 2015, only six months after the first autochthonous case was reported. And then by then, we didn't really know if what was causing these this microcephaly peak in my region, um, and it started spreading not only, it did not uh, restrain itself only to my state, it started spreading throughout Brazil. But one month later, we were able to see evidence of a live virus, um, not a live virus, I'm sorry, but of the virus was isolated in the brain of a baby that was aborted. And this paper came out in November and everybody found that this could really be the evidence we needed to correlate and prove that Zika and microcephaly were related. But by then in November, we everything was um, revolving around microcephaly and the neurological findings. We had no idea that these babies could have any other issues in the, systemically um, until, so this was November, right? And then in December, we decided to assess these babies because since we didn't know it was a new disease, how come they, they had neurological findings and the eye is just an extension of the brain? Was the eye affected or not? So we decided to examine these babies. And in January, we were able to report the three first babies with the with uh, ocular findings and microcephaly. So we had no serology when we published th this article. It was a presumed diagnosis. We ruled out all of the torches in these babies. And we said that since all the torches that could be causing microcephaly, calcification in the brain, and ocular findings were ruled out, we were talking about this new entity and maybe con a con new congenital infection. So this was the first time we mentioned it, and now we know that we're talking about a syndrome, and it's congenital Zika syndrome, the name we have given it. Um, of course, the neurological findings are the main findings, and it's what really calls our attention at first, but they also have ocular hearing and skeletal findings. So talking about the neurological findings, of course, the microcephaly is the main uh, finding we see, but it's not a required criterion, and I will mention this a little bit 
our head. But these um, babies, they have hydrocephaly, no, they, I'm sorry, they have big ventricles, they have uh, calcification in the brain, and they, these calcifications, they are mainly subcortical and, sub, uh, and periventricular. So they are having a different, uh, um, they have neurological findings, but these findings are a little different from all the congenital infections we knew from before. The, the way the, the um, calcifications are found in the brain are different from the calcifications we see in Toxo and CMV, and that was when it all started because the pattern of calcifications um, brought big concern to the neurologists, and that was when all began. Um, but um, they also have the, the scalp. You can see to the right image, and to the right, the right. They have this uh, redundant scalp um, skin, which is because since the the skull collapses, the skin folds. So this is also have been reported in literature concerning congenital Zika syndrome, but it's not specific for congenital Zika syndrome. Um, hearing deficit have also, two articles have come out concerning the hearing issues and hearing loss in, in these babies, and they estimate up to 7% of the babies they have hearing find a hearing deficit. Skeletal findings such as uh, club foot and arthrogryposis have been reported in literature. We can see these images are from our babies, and they have. We just recently reported seven cases uh, concerning these babies with microcephaly, neurological findings, but also skeletal findings. And of course, the, the ocular findings. These are the ones that I will talk a little bit more. So the, the, one of our recent studies have shown that babies with congenital Zika syndrome, they can have up, up to 55% of them can have ocular findings. And the ocular findings involve basically three regions or three tissues in the eye, so the retina, the optic nerve, and the retinal vessels. And then talking a little bit of the retinal findings, we can see in these images that there are mainly, mainly two types of lesions. The chorioretinal scars that we see this, maybe I tried to point out. So these scars, and basically they involve the macula, which is the center part of our vision, but they can also like this other publication, this is not from our group, but it's from the Paulo and Freitas. He's, he's seen these babies also in uh, El Salvador, which is a state, a city from a state south to where we are. And he has been seeing um, more aggressive lesions than we saw in our babies, as you can see in his images. So he has published this image and this other image. And these scars, they basically are, are identified in the macula, but you can find it elsewhere. And they can vary in size and shape and the amount, so you can have, see only one lesion or multiple lesions. And the other type of lesion is the pigmentation. So the, this pigment modeling can be gross, as we can see in this image, but it can be fine. And maybe if you're examining fast, so maybe you can miss this pigmentation in the macular region. Um, talking about the optic nerve findings, we can see optic nerve pallor. So we see here how pale the optic nerve is and atrophic. So the, the hypoplasia of the optic nerve, it's a small nerve, pale, and there's atrophy around it. So it's very aggressive what the virus can do to the eye. These babies have also vasculature abnormalities. We don't see, like in this case, and in this case, we don't see the retinal vessels. So the, we have vasculature findings as well. And Miranda and all, that it's another uh, a collab, another scientist has described, investigator, he has described the, the hemorrhages and peripheral abnormalities in these eyes, which in my cases I have not seen, but he has described in literature. So some for you to have an idea of how can what we are seeing in Zika, how it differs from other congenital infections. So congenital tox toxoplasmosis is very common in my country. In Brazil, it's endemic. And we see lots of cases like these ones that the scarring also affects the macula, but you see more pigmentation to it. So it's a different way, a, a different lesion compared to what we're seeing in Zika. 
Rubella, you, congenital rubella is also a differential diagnosis that we also have to rule out in these cases. Um, but they, the, the, um, the pigmentation that rubella causes is a more diffuse pigmentation. And when we compare it to Zika, we see it more uh, towards the macula than in rubella. And cytomegalovirus is CMV is very different from Zika. We can it's not something we are really concerned. It's uh, the lesions we see in Zika is very different from the CMV when we talk about the eye. Um, CMV affects basically it follows the the arcades the vessels while Zika it doesn't matter um, it doesn't really follow the vessels it will retain it will affect basically the macular region so. It's different, but we also ruled out in all of our cases. And syphilis can mimic anything in the eye, so you always have to rule out syphilis because you can have scars, pigmentation, it can really vary. Other ocular findings have also been reported involving congenital Zika syndrome, but these have not been uh, substantial. So one case, sporadical cases have been be reported about the iris coloboma, lens subluxation, cataract, and microphthalmia by these authors to the right. And uh, one of the main concerns, uh, one of the, our main questions nowadays is, can the eye provide us with more information of when the infection occurred? So coloboma, we know that the coloboma uh, is, happens when the, the ocular fissure does not close. And this ocular fissure usually closes during embryology at sixth week of pregnancy. Uh, post-fertilization. So since we only had one or two cases in the literature talking about coloboma, you cannot use this data to standardize or correlate it with the six week of pregnancy, nor can we use the um, Congen the cataract, because only one case in the literature reported cataract in these babies, so we cannot say that this happened between the fourth or fifth week of pregnancy because we are not seeing this often in our cases. But we are seeing a lot of optic nerve hypoplasia and then and the optic nerve starts being formed in, uh, in the eye at uh, six weeks of gestation, but it goes, it keeps on developing until the third trimester. So maybe the optic nerve, which we are seeing in these cases, can bring us some information and we're trying to have a study analyzing only the optic nerves of these babies and try to get some information from that and maybe come to a period in gestation when the, um, these mothers are more likely to have um, babies with ocular findings. What we know is that we have already discovered some a couple of risk factors related to these ocular findings. We know that mothers that were infected in the first trimester, they have more chances of ba having babies with uh, ocular findings, where we don't know it within the first trimester when is this aggression really happening? We also know that depending on the severity of the microcephaly, these babies can have more chance of having ocular findings. So the smaller the head circumference is at birth, more chances this baby will have an ocular finding. And so what we know nowadays, uh, CEC has um, set recommendations, and for ocular screening in these babies, they have established that the initial uh, exam should be done within one month when the babies um, that are born, uh, they have laboratory evidence. So a mother that uh, went to a country or had symptoms during pregnancy, if they have this laboratory or history of, of Zika infection, these babies should be screened at birth. Or babies that are born, that mothers had no symptoms or could not be tested in their countries, but they were born and during their assessment, they realized, physicians realized that they have an abnormal clinical or neurodevelopment or a neuroimaging that is consistent with a congenital infection. They should also have their ocular examination because before we know that microcephaly was a required criterion for these babies to be assessed ophthalmologically, but we have reported this case where a baby was born in Brazil in our city and the baby had normal head circumference, had um, 
um, the neurologist, the pediatrician referred to the neurologist because noticed that the baby was the baby was having con um, spasms of the superior and inferior members, um, and because of that, the neurology started screening the baby and saw that the baby had calcification in the brain and referred to us, and we saw that the baby actually had a scar. As we can see, it's a small scar, but it's really in the center of vision. So uh, because of this article, we were able to change spe specifically the Brazilian um, criterion because they were only being referred to us after they had the microcephaly and then they started being investigated. But with this, we were able to change our government, the way we were thinking of congenital Zika syndrome. And so what we do nowadays, what we are trying to do as an initial evaluation for the eyes in these babies is that we analyze not the anterior part of the eye and the back part of the eye with when they are born. Uh, that we dilate their eyes and we, we, we analyze the fundus because we know the fundus of the eye is the main uh, um, tissues and the, the main structures uh, um, that are affected by congenital Zika syndrome. And once these babies are detected with an ocular finding, or if they do not have an ocular finding, but they have other findings, neurological hearing consistent with congenital Zika findings, we, they become our patients, and then we start assessing them. At three months of age, we already see the, their vision, and we are uh, seeing what are the visual milestones that they are um, achieving and the ones that are, that they are not. And every three months, we are also dilating these eyes and analyzing if they're any changes of what we saw the, at first when they were born, if it's changing with time. So far, we are not seeing any alteration of the, the fundus findings itself, like the, the scarring or the retinal findings. What we see is that with time, the optic nerve can change color from a normal pink disc to a pale disc, and we believe that this is happening due to the microcephaly itself, and because of this the connection between the brain and the eye, the, the brain is so impaired that with time the optic nerve also suffers and becomes atrophic. So also the, the babies that do not have ocular findings but have other findings consistent with congenital Zika syndrome, we find it very important to also follow the, their visual acuity because we're seeing that even if you have a normal anatomical eye, these babies actually can be severely visually impaired due to their brain abnormalities. So at six months, this has not come out from CDC, but this our babies now are growing and we need to keep on assessing them. We are also assessing their motility and we are seeing if they need glasses. With time, they are, are having um, signs of vi severe visual impairment. So when once we refract these babies and we prescribe glasses, where we are stimulating their vision, we believe that we are treating them and maybe they will have a better vision. If we don't do anything, they will stay where they are, but if we re rehabilitate them, maybe they will have a better vision in the future. But of course, there are many things that we don't know. We don't know, for example, the, visual, the pathophysiology of the, what is happening, really happening to these ocul the ocular tissue. What, what specifically um, the virus causes that makes all this aggression to the eye. We know that sim maybe it has to do with what is happening to the brain. It, maybe it's correlated because we know many of the articles that have come out and have tested mice have shown that does the virus attacks the progenitor cells in the brain and it causes cell death and then brain uh, organized organoids reduction and consequently we have microcephaly. So since the, um, the retina in the eye have neurons and they are connected to br the brain and we have seen that uh, live virus have been identified in the eyes of mice, we believe that the virus itself is causing all of this aggression to the retina as well, but we have no proof of it yet. 
we also don't know if the a viral load, depending on the amount of virus, if it plays a, a different role in the eye. Why does some of the babies have the scar and why does some of the babies only have the pigmentation? Why is that? We don't know if there's any cofactor involved. Um, if the disease can be reactivated in these babies, we all only will only know this with time. And if they can be reinfected with a different strain, for example, that we also do not know. Um, we many of the questions regarding these babies is the life expectancy. At first, people said, "Oh, they will die soon," but our babies, the eldest baby, is one year and three months now, and the baby is alive and no other concerns. And in our institution, we are now following 231 babies. And these babies are progressing, and they're um, with rehabilitation. They're doing much better than before. So we are really don't know what are the long-term effects on them. If with time they will have respiratory issues, um, recurrent infections, we, we really do not know. So we're following these babies, and now we are assessing their visual impairments. So, like I mentioned, they are developing strabismus with time and nystagmus, and here. It's just show. I don't know if the oh there was this was a video, but I, so we are. This is only to show how we test the babies, the the visual acuity. There is an examiner that shows teller cards, which are it's a, a card with stripes, black stripes. Half of the card has black stripes, black and white stripes, and the other half is just a gray. And they will start showing the baby, and depending on their visual acuity, they can will follow the stripes. And then we start increasing the frequency of these cards, so the stripes starts getting thinner and thinner until the baby cannot perceive how, uh, and they the, the the baby cannot perceive the stripes, and the baby will think it's just a gray board and will not be attracted by the lines and will start stop seeing. So we can predict more or less how the vision, um, how severely impaired these babies are by testing their vision with the teller cards. And this will be coming out soon, the, the information regarding. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but I have it in my computer. If you're interested, I can show you later. Um, so, of course, we have this expectation that the vaccine will come out soon. That's our hope that we will avoid many other infections. But this is for the future, right? Right now, we have, like I mentioned, 231 babies in our institution and where we can provide now what we can offer to these families and these babies is rehabilitation. So we have started the visual rehabilitation, hearing rehabilitation, um, also the motor, they, many of them have spasms and they have um, hypertonicity, so they're being assessed at our institution. Many need um, glasses, uh, the, the magnifying glasses to be uh, um, to be visually assessed and treated, and some of them also need hearing aids. So all of this is being done. Many of these mothers, they suffer from anxiety, depression, and so we found it very important to have a support group for them. We have founded a support group, and these mothers, they have therapy in groups, but also individually, because each one of them have their own, um, they have to be seen as individuals as well. But we see that as groups, as a group, they can help each other and find ways through this. We also um, have, we are starting to, not starting, but we have also taught these mothers how to stimulate these babies at home. So we have um, provided them with kits, handcrafted kits, where they take these kits home and they are assessing and treating and stimulating their babies at home. But of course, this is very challenging. It's a new disease for everyone, and we were not prepared, like all these all diseases that arises. Um, and these babies require a multidisciplinary treatment. Like I have been mentioning, it's not only ophthalmology, it's not only neurology, it's a big team involved, and most of this treatment is costly, and we, we depend basically on the government because most of our patients, they belong to low-income uh, low family, 
and they cannot afford uh, private treatment. So the, the foundation is a center, a nonprofit center. We provide care for free for the poor. And we have been have, having a lot of challenge, challenges because Brazil have, has been going through a very difficult economic and political crisis. But we have been gathering help all over. And RTI, I would like to thank here for the opportunity because it's one of the um, partners that we see a lot of potential for the future, near future, I hope, and for a, a long future. So thank you so much for your attention. I, I'm happy to answer any of your questions if you have any. Just going to make a <clears throat> couple of quick comments and then please use the microphone <clears throat> to ask questions so that people online can hear as well. So um, I guess you can imagine that Recife is really the epicenter of where this is all happening. And it's happening in real time. It's not something they could have planned and said, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to get ready for this thing. It just, it just happened. And so it's really remarkable what uh, Camilla and her colleagues have been able to do to rapidly not only scale up to serve literally hundreds of children and their families, but also to write about it and share with, uh, in, in the peer review literature, Dr. Ventura has published in the in the top quality, uh, top the best journals in the world on this, uh, and so is really they're really becoming known as the authoritative uh, source for information on really how this affects babies, both in a functional kind of way and in a more basic um, biological kind of way. Uh, so we owe a lot of debt to the to the Brazilian community and especially to the colleagues in Recife. Um, the NIH meeting um, last last week was it just last week? <laughs> um, it was very <clears throat> very clear that so much of the information is coming out from not only this group from a, but from a group of neurology um, uh, clinicians there as well, and the findings about what we know about Zika just continue to change every day. Just a new surprise every day. So in this meeting, there was reported that some babies are having normal head circumference at birth, for example, but then develop microcephaly over time because they're not progressing as fast as other other babies. Some are developing hydrocephaly. Um, so it's really, I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg on this, and there'll be many more interesting findings to come. And we're very much hoping that we can uh, collaborate uh, more. Well, we will collaborate. We're hoping we can get funding to continue the collaboration in a much more systematic way. So let's open it up for comments and questions. And I know uh, you may have some online, Cliff, but yeah, Phil. Excuse me. Do we know? Thank you for the talk. Uh, do we know anything about the um, the proportion of asymptomatics versus symptomatics and their rates of trend, their difference in the rates of transmission? It seems to be a vital thing to assess risk. Yes, the, um, about the symptoms, we we have asked many, all of the mothers, so the last publication in JAMA Ophthalmology where we were assessing the risk factors, uh, the, it really, I cannot tell you the percentage right now, but when, when we, the percentage of mothers that referred symptoms, they are similar to what we have already in literature, that only 20% of the, the patients infected have really symptoms. I can find, I can provide it in a moment, the exact percentage, but it was very similar and it was um, comparable to what was already in literature. Um, the vir can you repeat, I'm sorry, the second question, part of your question? Transmission between the, between the symptomatics and the asymptomatics, is it the same? So we don't have that information. So what we, we I, um, so that you can understand and I can answer your question, these babies came to us because first they started being screened for neurological findings and they came to our institution for us to analyze, assess the ocular findings and provide rehabilitation. So we do not have still a study that have analyzed all the pregnant women because we, when we realized what was going on in Brazil, these babies were already being born. So what we are now aware is that NIH is funding a big study, the ZIP study, where they will follow pregnant women and from there they will see how many they convert, serolo convert serologically 
and how many of the ones that converted during pregnancy, how many actually had symptoms. And from those, all of them, how many had babies with congenital Zika syndrome. So this is an, a data, super important data, but we do not have, because we did not plan for the infection, it just got to us, you know. But this, we hope to have this answer soon. Yes, this question is about cofactors. Um, the, the the rate of um, microcephaly or, or other other um, effects in Recife or in that area has that differed dramatically from other parts of Brazil? And if so, is there any thoughts on what cofactors may cause that? Yeah, so Brazil, it's like the U.S., a big country, right? And northeast of Brazil, it's warmer, and our winter. It's only rain. We don't have, it doesn't get cold. We don't have um, snow, none of that. But south of Brazil, we have a cold weather. There, we can have snow um, and all of that. So when everything began, like the first case that the first infection reported was in May. In May in Brazil, it's when you're starting to have the winter, so the rain season, okay? And we, we start, um, having cold, cold, uh, weather in the south of Brazil. So the mosquito can, cannot resist to the winter. So that's how, in my mind, we don't have proof, okay? These are all theories that has, Arise, arising. Um, so we believe that why did Northeast have more Zika first uh, than south of Brazil was due to the weather. But now when you go and see in Brazil, we have all the states, states of Brazil have reported Zika by now. And the, the state now that we consider the hot state where we're having a lot of uh, congenital Zika babies is south of, it's one of the states south of Brazil. So it, we have to um, follow the seasons and analyze because maybe um, Florida is a warm state and have starting to have cases but uh, we have to think will the northern states have infection or the seasonality we need to analyze that this is just one of our theories how why northeast of brazil another very important thing is uh, the information is that northeast brazil is the poorest one of the poorest regions of brazil so we know that poverty is related to bad hygiene and then more infections and all of that. So we think that maybe another theory is that there are cofactors, um, maybe a, a, um, a patient, uh, an individual, was exposed previously to another infection that caused a predisposition to have a baby with congenital Zika infection. So these are theories that are we wish to have answers soon, but we, we don't. Uh, for the talk, um, I'm not sure ex that this is completely applicable to your research, but as you probably know, uh, sleep and wake cycles are controlled by non-vision areas of, of the human eye. So I, I'm wondering if um, if you've done any measurements on how the sleep and wake cycles of Zika children compare to uh, normal babies. Not yet, but we are very interested in the development of the baby as a glo the global development. They're very irritative. They, they cry nonstop. Many of them, um, like the um, last week, the neurologist was saying, um, Vanessa van der Linden is part of our group. She's an excellent, excellent uh, pediatric neurologist, and she has been reporting this in literature that um, these babies, they can have different issues, and these issues can be represented in by the cry. So they have these neurological cries that can be due to seizures because they have more chances of having seizures, um, but also because they have a lot of reflux, and the reflux can cause the uh, irritation in these babies and all of that. Um, they have a lot of trouble in sleeping, but I cannot tell you in percentage right now because these are our plan for the near future to assess the development, uh, the, the um, 
communication skills, the behavior skills, all of this, we're so interested, but it requires time for us to give these answers. I agree, it's, it has not um, a lot to do, the sleep has not a lot to do with the eyes, it has more to do with the brain, and um, the brain controls most, like our body, and the sleep center in the brain, we don't know what are the areas, exact areas that are affected, so we have also this idea of a study where we are trying to correlate the brain findings and what we see in the eye and try to correlate that. What are the brain areas, the major brain areas that have been um, impaired, affected, and then try to correlate that with the eyes as well. So many questions, little answers by now. Thanks for your, thanks for your great talk. Um, you know, a lot of the information we get that there's other institutions and other governments who are coming to assist and partner with Brazil, and I'm interested in hearing more about um, the dynamics between Brazilian um, institutions and those external um, organizations coming into your country. So about our government, it's very hard to address this issue because um, it has been known internationally how Brazil is, has been affected we do not have a president, and all of that brings a lot of consequent effects, and it's a domino effect. Once you are having a political issue, and then it becomes an economical issue, no investment coming into the country, everybody taking investment out of Brazil. So we are not, um, so that you understand our problem, since we gained 231 babies and sons and daughters in our institution, we are not being paid for any of those new patients. The ones that we already had, we are being paid, um, but um, late. So we will be paid for one month, and then two months we won't receive payment. So, And then they are always late regarding what we had before, and the new babies, the new patients we have, we are not having any support from the government. But we have been knocking a lot on their doors and we hope that at some point they will hear us and see how important and valuable these babies are and how you can change a baby's life and the, the consequences in our society once you invest in treatment and professionals and care. So I don't, I don't have a better answer for you, but that's the answer I have. And regarding the new partnerships, you said um, we have been approached by people concerning and uh, that are seeing us as potential. Many of us wants to know answer. The thing is, okay, so we want to know how are they sleeping, how are their development, and all of that. But um, the government in Brazil is not seeing that as a potential, and people of abroad is seeing that as a potential. And little by little, people are, are coming to us and showing interest. Um, we are knowing little by little of institutions and foundations that are willing to help. So RTI was perfect because um, we didn't know about RTI, and it has been uh, serendipity because uh, things has been falling into place. And what it's interesting for you, it's interesting for us. And we are building up partners. We have now a partner with a partnership with the University of Kansas, another partnership with the University of Nebraska. So little by little, we are starting to have our fundings. And I have I answered all of your questions. Okay, well, Kristen uh, Stoka, following up on that, says that RTI is the data coordinating center for the ZIP study that you mentioned earlier. And uh, Peter McDonald would like to know, how do the ocular sequela seen so far with the Zika compare with other flaviviruses? 
Okay, I'll answer the second question first. So this, we comparing to dengue that is endemic in Brazil, we don't have West Nile in Brazil and, and Japanese encephalitis. So what we have as another flavor virus so that we could compare to what we're seeing in Zika is dengue. And dengue in kids in baby in newborns uh, as a congenital infection we haven't seen anything regarding dengue and we have the four serotypes of dengue in in brazil so we haven't seen but in adults dengue can cause retinal hemorrhages um, these are the only reports we have in literature concerning another flavor virus which is dengue which is very different from what we're seeing in Zika. Um, Zika in adults, I forgot to mention, but it, um, in adults we have seen reports on ocular inflammation, so not only conjunctivitis that we knew about, but now we're seeing uveitis, which is the inflammation of the tissues inside the eye. And this uh, uveitis usually is bilateral, so both eyes are involved, and there is hypertension of the eye. So th this is a type of uveitis that um, it has it's common to other viruses as well. So Zika in adults can cause uh, uveitis, and we have one report on uh, maculopathy. It was a young male that was also proven to have uh, the um, acute infection, Zika infection, and he had a low vision in one of the eyes, and when he was tested, we saw he had a maculopathy, but he, after topical treatment and after the viremia, he normalized his vision and all of that. So these are the reports on adults concerning Zika. Of course, many, it's very interesting because uh, we are seeing now at the University of Miami two cases that we are trying to rule, we are ruling out everything and maybe it's Zika is a optic nerve neuritis in one young patient as well as the Vic syndrome. So we are seeing little by little, we are seeing more adult cases concerning Zika infection. But I have to be honest that my focus really has been um, children the congenital Zika infection, but I have read in literature. I haven't seen these babies, uh, or these patients, the, the adult patients myself. Um, what was the first question? I'm sorry. Concerning the ZIP. Yeah, it was just a comment about the uh, ZIP study. But we do have another question, uh, or several here. What is, what is the evidence that Zika may be transmitted via human body fluids, that is semen, and Zika may be related to the development of neurological problems in adults. As a follow-up, are there any findings which suggest that the mothers may also be affected by Zika-related neurological problems? These are great questions. Um, I can tell you in mothers, they, the neurological findings, I cannot go there. But the, what I can say is that we assessed all mothers. We didn't know in the beginning if the babies, only the babies would have ocular findings or mothers could also have ocular findings. So at first, in the beginning, December, January, we uh, assessed 138 mothers and their children and their, their baby. And we saw that none of the mothers had any signs of infection, active infection, or scars similar or different from what we were seeing the babies. But I cannot tell you if they had any neurological um, findings because we did not assess that. Um, and concerning, sorry, I always forget the first question. Oh, the ways of transmission I have, we still do not know how, what's the real risk of having the, the if it changes also, the, the question is really, if uh, someone is, has the infection, is infected by a mosquito or sexually transmitted, do they, do the, these babies have a different risk of having congenital Zika syndrome? We are, I just found out that there's a study going on um, trying to see the, the, the sexual transmission in these, these patients, but it's so difficult to say, okay, was it sexually or was a mosquito that bit someone? This is, these answers are very hard to answer. I don't, don't have this answer right now. Thank you. Well, we have one other question. Is, is there any evidence that previous dengue virus changes 
one, the risk of Zika infection, or two, the severity of Zika virus among pregnant women? We don't have any evidence, but this is something that we have planning on. It's one of the, the next studies. We are collecting um, specimen of mothers and babies, and we are trying to find other co-infections, um, not only the virus, but also parasites, because in Brazil and in, in the poor regions, we have lots of parasites, we call that in English, okay, parasites, to see if there is any correlation with any other in previous infection or current infection, but we don't have that answer either. Um, I just, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the rehabil rehabilitation and the types of therapy that you can provide to babies, um, just like what that looks like, how intensive is it, um, you know, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but just if you could talk a little bit about what, what that is. Yeah, so we have the different types of rehabilitation. So we have first to assess each baby and see if they have hearing, ocular, uh, motor, what are the, the disabilities that they have. Um, when we're talking about hearing, of course, there are diff um, different levels of hearing deficit. Sometimes with just a, a, a hearing aid, you can have a baby that was not responsive. We have this video I forgot to bring, but it's a baby that was before using a hearing aid and then we put the hearing aid and now it be the baby became social. And so the rehabilitation, the hearing rehabilitation, it's more instantaneous or you rehabilitate or not. The ocular rehabilitation is a process. So we see how severely impaired they are. And if they have, let's say, an ocular finding right in the center of vision, the macula, we believe that because due to the neuroplasticity of these babies, they can actually, unconsciously, they will choose if they are rehabilitated, if they have patching so we can stimulate with light, colors, um, frequ different frequencies like stripes. Um, we, we can rehabil rehabilitate these babies and we believe that with vis vi um, visual therapy, they can choose another area of their eyes that is was not affected by the virus and they can have a functional vision not we still do not know how much of the vision they will have but we believe like toxo and cmv these babies they can have other um, uh, 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 an area close to the center of vision and they can develop vision in another area of their eyes. But of course we're talking about babies that have uh, a cerebral function. So this is all so new that we don't know even doing all of these therapies will the brain respond and all of that. The motor rehabilitation is a lot of uh, therapy, like um, physical therapy, meaning they have, so they are so contracted, hypertonic, that most of them, they, the, the mothers are taught how to do the, it's kind of a massage, but it's um, repetitive movements and uh, at home because these babies come once a week to our center. They come from the countryside. They are not easy. They do not have easily easy access to us and so we had to provide them with what they needed to do the therapies and rehabilitation in their homes as well so mothers are really engaged and they feel part of the treatment which is very nice to see how it's all working out little by little thank you so again, thank you very much so I think just a couple of additional comments. So you know, we really, this is, these babies are in what we, many of us would think would be a critical period in their development. And it's a, I guess, both from a scientific perspective, but also from a humanistic perspective of what kind of neural reorganization could happen if you're, if you're not seeing out of one eye, could the adaptation could you do things that could help the baby see more strongly out of the other eye, how much of that is <clears throat> naturally occurring versus what needs to be structured from other kinds of um, <clears throat> intervention. So um, it, it provides a very um, unique and important opportunity to look at what, because you look at the, a lot of the babies and you go, oh my gosh, look, it's hopeless. But it's not really hopeless. There's, the baby, there's much that can be done. 
Uh, but we need, a, this is really a learning laboratory here for figuring out what that can be. The other thing, um, she didn't, she only mentioned some, but this, for the families, this is obviously a very challenging experience for them. So first of all, they didn't expect this. Um, they were looking forward to having a baby. And um, all of a sudden you have a baby that's very, very severely compromised. You've got a baby that's crying almost sometimes 24 seven. You can't sleep, the baby can't sleep. Uh, the babies are, um, uh, again, again, quite irritable. Some have feeding uh, challenges, and sometimes the mothers are losing some of their social support systems. Or, and so um, this is a very interesting and challenging time for, for these families. And so uh, it's, a even, it's, of course, a very challenging time for the Institute when the babies are only coming there once a week, and you're saying, well, what can we do? So. Um,